Okay, I'm going to get started. So I'm Dan, I'm from CERN, and I'm going to present some uh, recent, I'm going to present Ceph and the CERN HPC infrastructure. Um, to call out my coworker here, Arne Vibalk, sitting in the front. He's, I work on the Ceph side of things, Arne manages the OpenStack side of things, so we can work together if you have questions at the end. Um, this picture behind the thing you hear, actually can see what CERN is. CERN is this, is this tunnel. This is the LHC tunnel underneath the, the ground 100 meters below the surface, um, close to Geneva in Switzerland. Um, it's a tunnel, it's so large, it's 20, what is it, 27 kilometers wide. You have to sometimes ride a bike if you want to go around the whole thing. Um, and that's actually a super uh, conducting magnet there, the blue thing, to accelerate beams up to almost the speed of light. Um, it basically, it looks like this. We have four different experiments at some point around the detector, uh, around the accelerator. Each of those is like a giant digital camera taking pictures of particle collisions. We basically smash the, the, these particles together, take the pictures. Um, this is what those cameras look like. They're huge. You can actually find the, find the scientist in there, down at the bottom. Um, and this is what the pictures look like. So this is a reconstructed image of what a Higgs boson might look like, okay? So you can tell by basically what the byproducts of the collision are to know that this was a Higgs boson. Um, so to do all of that, we need a lot of computing, of course. Um, we have now currently, this is a picture from inside one of our data centers. We now have around 300 petabytes of storage and well, 230,000 CPU cores, that's probably more since this is not the latest slide. Um, and actually, we're part of a, of a worldwide computing grid with uh, around 200 universities around the world um, that combined their, their computing power to, make, uh, to process all the data. One of those computer centers is actually really close by here in Vancouver. It's called Triumph. Um, so, yeah. So now I'll get onto the, the meat of the talk. Um, you know, we've been using Ceph at CERN since 2013. Actually, Arne and I started this project. Um, this was our first little kind of memo proposing an internal uh, project to prove, do a proof of concept of Ceph for OpenStack. This was our first cluster um, that we built in the middle of 2013. Um, we had three petabytes then. It was this, it was this whole row of, of storage. Um, when we first got it, we had hard drives only, and then we realized, oh, you're gonna need some SSDs also for journaling, so we, so we retrofitted, we removed some HDDs and plugged in 200 SSDs, um, so we had a lot of fun, and since then, uh, things have grown. We, had, we started with the 30 terabytes proof of concept, then made a three petabytes cluster, um, then following that, we got really excited about implementing, we, we, we contributed to the erasure coding in Ceph, uh, we wrote something that's called Rados Striper for, for striping objects across multiple OSDs. We wrote something even called Rados FS, which was a simple non-POSIX but file system-like thing that's since been deprecated. Um, in 2016, we upgraded our block storage cluster from three to six petabytes, all with no downtime. Um, and then by late last year, we had eight different clusters in production for different use cases. These are our eight clusters. So we have still our, like the main big killer use case is OpenStack, Cinder, and Glance, where we have a five and a half petabyte cluster. Um, we have another smaller cluster in our satellite data center, a uh, thousand kilometers away. Um, CephFS now, we, ha we now have several clusters. So we have, a, we have a production, almost one petabyte cluster that we'll be talking about today. Um, and then we have some test clusters and we have a hyperconverged HPC cluster, which I'll also focus on today. Then we have, um, this castor and X root, these are physics applications, so we store some physics data in these clusters as well. Um, and we have uh, an S3 Swift Rattles Gateway cluster for uh, object storage. Plus we have around five petabytes in the pipeline. You know, as clusters fill up, we put them, we add that capacity where it's needed. We'll focus on CephFS today. So HPC at CERN. So, you know, CERN is mostly a high throughput computing lab. We do um, file-based parallelism. So when we're processing these uh, particle collisions, each job can be independent. There's no like message passing, there's no MPI. So it's very easy to run our 230,000 cores in parallel. It's, you, can, you can have a very simple infrastructure. 
Um, but we do have typical HPC use cases as well. Uh, when engineers need to simulate the, the, the beams and the collision, they need to do things like uh, these various three-letter acronyms. Um, and then they need, they have conventional uh, MPI applications that they need full positive consistency, they need parallel I.O. Um, so that's why we, we look. Okay, yeah, so these are some examples, okay, of various plots that the HPC guys generate when they're simulating beams, um, simulating magnets. Uh, they can make very nice plots. And we also do uh, design, we do, we do circuit design for um, inside each of those particle detectors, there's like hundreds of thousands of small ASICs Which data? Both, both. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain. Um, yeah, so there's also a, so there's ASICs design that we also have. This is another kind of MPI type application. Um, and we want to do HPC on open infrastructure. You know, so we build HPC clusters with commodity components and open source software. Um, we buy, so we we buy the machines we have are similar to our normal batch systems, but then we use InfiniBand uh, low latency networks. Um, we have accelerators like GPUs in the pipeline as well that we, that we have tests. Um, on the software side, we use software like HT Condor and Slurm for doing the scheduling, all the MPI scheduling. Um, and then on the storage side, uh, we want to really like extend what we know about Ceph already through block storage and object storage to use that also for, for uh, HPC. Um, this is our first attempt at an, at an HPC infrastructure. Okay, so there's some details there about what the nodes are. Um, you see they're basically like uh, somehow powerful Xeon chips with 128 gigs of memory and some, some local, local drives for, uh, for local scratch storage on the nodes themselves, but then um, low latency ethernet and uh, other communication chips. Okay, but the main point of this initial first attempt was that the compute nodes were some one place in the data center, and then for, for access in the storage, there was a Ceph cluster somewhere else in the data center. Um, so we were using, uh, this was a basically, it was, it was originally Ceph dual release with file store. Um, we have three times replication across hosts in the, in the cluster, and then the MDS is actually just on VMs in our cloud, somewhere else in our data center. So it's really just like, you know, Agile, we just, just boot it, let the MDS run wherever it is. And, uh, and actually, in general, it works. I mean, there's no, let's say the users are mostly happy. Um, but when we design our next, oh, yeah, so by the way, we had that in production since mid-2016, around one petabytes and around 300 client nodes using this. And it's, so this was where we kind of really got our first experience with CephFS to make sure that it's stable and, uh, and, and, and uh, compatible with all of the MPI applications. Um, oh, by the way, this was also like uh, all of the hardware was like manually provisioned, manually managed um, physical nodes for the, for the compute nodes. But now when we want to do like our version two of the HPC infrastructure, we're looking at hyperconverged. So we basically, the basic idea is to take the, the same compute nodes that we have exact, uh, in the previous cluster, but fill the empty drive slots with some flash, and then put Ceph OSDs on there and run Ceph directly on the nodes where we're doing the processing. Um, you can see the details there. We have four SSDs, four one terabyte SSDs. One of them we leave for the, for the like, operating system and local scratch storage for the, for the jobs, and then we run three OSDs. Um, this cluster, so we act, we're using Luminous. This is a new thing. It's Luminous with Blue Store. Um, we do. We have several racks. This this cluster has got several racks, and we do rack-wise replication. And we also use the we use Ethernet. Ceph uses Ethernet for replication, and we leave all of the InfiniBand stuff to the MPI applications. And by the way, we use OpenStack uh, Ironic to provision this this hardware now. So we want to benchmark this. So how do you benchmark this kind of thing? So we've developed several tools internally for benchmarking storage. Um, we do things like periodic 
like very short micro benchmarks to see over time how the performance is evolving. Um, and we also do things like uh, we're curious about the latency of file system updates as seen across the cluster. So we have this thing called FS ping, where you can, from two nodes, you can kind of ping nodes through the file system to see how it's going. Um, but you know, these are non-standard <laughs> benchmarks. They're not really generally interesting. They're fun, but not, not, you can't really draw big conclusions from these things. Um, so we look more for standard storage benchmarks. And in the HPC world, there's, um, there, is, there are two standard benchmarks, okay? They're called MD test and they're called IOR. And these, uh, at Supercomputing 2017, um, there was a paper where they, where they introduced this new kind of like meta benchmark called IO500, where they're trying to make a standardized benchmark that we can run on storages, all HPC storages, to, so that you can compare. You can compare your good runs and your bad runs and share configurations to try to, you know, so the community can together learn how to optimize storage for HPC. Um, these, uh, so you can test the bandwidth and metadata performance. And by the way, I won't go into the details of the tests itself, but that's just to say that there's easy and hard modes of all the benchmarks. Easy storage is when every job is doing I.O. to a unique file. Um, hard storage is when you're doing parallel I.O. all to one single file. So that's where that's where that gets difficult. Um, this was our baseline score uh, when we just, on this cluster, with uh, just installed fresh Luminous version 12.2.4. Um, there's, there's some more details about what the cluster is there. There's, there's um, yeah, around 400 OSDs. It says two per server. There's actually three, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, so we get a score. It doesn't matter what the absolute value is here, but it's just to show you that we actually made the top 10, yay, because there were only nine other submissions. <laughs> so, so our score was 2.46, and number nine was 4.25. OK, so what does that mean? It's, it's something interesting. Um, but then we wanted to get into really debugging CephFS performance, see how different things impact the performance of your CephFS cluster. So we're not gonna, I'm going to explain like, what those things are. So basically, OK, I'll just go through these one by one. So in Ceph Luminous, you have multi-active MDSs. And internally, Ceph is rebalancing the subtrees between these MDSs. Okay? So if it detects that one directory is very like, hot and another one uh, is, is like idle, another uh, MDS is idle, it'll shift part of that workload to the other MDS. It does this dynamically behind the scenes. Um, this is useful like in the long term to balance the, the MDSs, but if you're doing a benchmark, this can actually stall I.O. because it, when it's shifting this, this workload around, um, it can be several seconds that things wait. So if you're doing a short-term benchmark, you want to do pinning. Um, so actually, you can do this. You can, in Ceph, you can say, I want this directory to always be assigned to this MDS. And if you do this kind of change, then, for example, you can get a, well, three times speed up in, up in one of the benchmarks, OK? Um, we actually, we're actually so like, we, we like pinning now so much that we actually developed a tool, um, which is here. It's in GitHub to let you shard. If you take a directory, you can like split it across MDSs so that you just kind of like randomly assign them to an MDS and pin them there. And then this way you have like, if you have different users or different shares on your CephFS, you can have them uh, balanced across the systems. Um, so there's something also called lazy I.O., okay? Lazy I.O. was proposed as an extension to the POSIX standard several years ago now. Um, and Ceph actually implemented this thing called lazy I.O. Um, but it never, I'm, I'm not sure of this, where the status of the lazy I.O. proposal is, but the implementation is still there in Ceph. So what this, what this does is it lets, it lets you basically, when you open a file, it lets you tell the storage system that if you open that from several different parallel clients, that you can just trust the clients that they're going to do something sane. They're not going to like overwrite each other. So you can allow, you can basically relax the consistency a little bit of the file system. Um, so therefore, you can get more performance. So there is a CephFS patch to enable this for a whole for an entire mount now, which will be merged sometime soon. I hope. 
Um, and basically, the result of this patch, so if you have, so I mentioned the easy and hard mode of, uh, of the tests. So in this particular test, we were getting like two and a half gigabytes per second um, writing to separate files. And then if you have the benchmarks write to one file, you see the performance drops down to like much less, one quarter of the performance. But with this lazy I.O. mode, um, you see the benchmarks are basically the same. So it lets it treat parallel I.O. to single file. It lets it perform exactly like parallel I.O. to separate files. So this is a good thing. Um, next, we were, we were curious how important is the location of the MDS in the cluster. Um, obviously, you know, like latency is important. You know the client's going to be connecting to the MDS to do its IOs, but you're, we're never sure like how important and like maybe there's other bottlenecks in the system. So basically, we started with a cluster with, uh, with an MDS just somewhere in the same room in the data center, and that gave us this kind of number. Okay, like 2.6 kilo IOPS. And then by moving the MDS onto the same switch where the clients are, we got like three times better performance, IOPS performance, okay? So latency is super important, or the location of the MDS is super important. Um, next, we were curious what happens if we go from two replicas, or three replicas to two replicas? Okay, this is, this is, this is something that you might want to ask yourself sometimes. Um, and Basically, in the, we, we got something like 50% throughput speed up going from three to two replicas. Of course, maybe this is the danger zone, so you have to really be careful and assess the, whether you can do this or not. Ceph experts know, or Ceph operators probably know, um, that there's, this, uh, there's, there's a big trade-off in reliability if you go to two replicas. Um, in HPC land, we use this mainly as a scratch space, so if, there, if we did lose the whole cluster, it's kind of okay. So. Also, the SSDs tend to be super reliable. Um, next, we started playing with Crush. So this cluster that we have is actually spread across two network switches, two 10 gig network switches. And we wanted to see the impact if we do the replication, like if you choose one rack, one switch, and then replicate inside that switch, um, see if this has some performance impact. Um, so, with replication across either of the switches, you get performance like this, like 3.4, 3.3 gigabytes per second, and you can get about 10% more performance by doing the replication inside. So this is, again, yet another example of where keeping things close together gives you better performance. Um, when we, this is now, the next part is about tuning BlueStore itself. So when we started this cluster, because the MPI jobs like to use so much memory, we wanted to shrink down the, the Ceph memory as much as possible. So we started with 128 megabytes blue store cache, which is really tiny. Um, and then we want to see what would, the, what would happen to the performance if we bring it back to the default, which is three gigabytes. Um, and the answer is actually kind of inconclusive. So the tests got a little bit faster for, a couple of the tests got a little bit faster when we switched to, when we increased, but it wasn't really dramatic enough that we would be willing to pay that much in memory all the time. It can be that the tests, these, these benchmarks are too small, that they just fit in memory anyway. Um, so basically, we need more testing there to understand. And then the last thing that we did was to put all the clients all the OSDs, all the MDSs, everything on the same switch, and then see, if, see what the performance is. And indeed, yes, this gave us yet another roughly 10, 20% speed up uh, in throughput and, and IOPS also. So like the fastest zero hop network is the most important thing when you're building this kind of storage. Here's a summary of all of those scores that I just, um, that I just went through, all those ways that we used to tune CephFS. Um, and like basically left from left to right, you see that the, the bandwidth was going up and the IOPS, IOPS was basically going up and our final score went up. And our really like final, what I call maxi best of um, score, which is if we take all of our sub scores and add them all together, was like 5.56. So we basically can go to like number eight in this top, top list, which is pretty good. 
Um, there's other things that we can try, of course. Um, we can try, well, it's, it's well known by now that Ceph doesn't exploit all the IOPS of a single flash device. So common practice is to partition those flash devices and run multiple S OSDs per, per disk. So we could do that, we haven't done it yet. Um, we also, everything, all of these tests were reported with the Fuse client. We haven't yet tested the kernel client. It's now, actually now in RHEL 7.5, the kernel client is catching up where you can use it with, with, um, with shares. So uh, this is something to do really, really soon. And then also we haven't yet tested the RDMA messenger in Ceph to make use of the, the super low latency network that we have. Um, you might ask about, do we find this whole thing to be reliable? Um, one thing is that we do, we do find hanging uh, Ceph fuse mounts sometimes. Um, and the other thing is that we, we sometimes see, because of this hyperconverged infrastructure, we see like the fuse process sometimes be killed by like the out of memory killer. So if a user runs a job which is so huge, um, the OOM killer will just like decide who to kill and he's decided to kill Ceph fuse, which is not very nice. Um, so that second one, we're still, we have, we were using C groups to isolate things, but still it's not quite perfect. Um, so we're still working on there, but for the, for the first issue, hanging Ceph fuse mounts, we found a pretty good solution. It's a configuration issue. Um, basically, Ceph is ultra, ultra conservative about uh, if, a, if a client becomes, like, if it's not communicating back to the cluster with, with some frequency. Um, if the client connection goes stale, actually that fuse mount will just hang and then there's like no reconnection protocol. It just stays hung forever because the idea is that if something like that is happening, maybe the data has become inconsistent and really an operator should intervene to see what, what's going on and then kill the tasks and, and, um, and resolve the issue. But in a cluster with uh, hundreds or thousands of jobs running, um, kind of anything can happen. And you can, if you, if, you, if you read this document, you understand the, the client consistency rules of Ceph, you can relax that consistency slightly and you can configure it as, follow, as shown there. This gives you a way to let the clients reconnect. And since we moved to this configuration, basically it's, we, we don't see these hanging fuse mounts at all. So then that's like all about HPC. So we want to know if we can stretch it further beyond HPC. Um, we have had for a while now a general purpose NFS service built on top of, of what, it's our virtual NFS filer service. Um, this is just, you know, like kernel NFSD on top of ZFS, on top of Cinder RBD running in our OpenStack cloud. Um, we have uh, 60 terabytes of these across 30 servers, and it's actually really high performance. It's high enough performance. You can do, we can, one of our use cases, our puppet masters, is statting the, the file system at like 50 kilohertz, so it's working quite well. But this is, you know, after a few years of now running this, it's, it's, um, it's reaching its like scalability limits in terms of uh, like managing it, deploying those nodes, managing them each as a precious uh, server, and you can't really scale the performance horizontally. So, of course, this is the whole idea of Manila, right? Move to Manila and CephFS. So, We've now actually, we're now doing this in production. So because Manila has this such nice, easy to use self-service management interface, um, we can take everything that we learned about CephFS for HPC and then just manage it with Manila. And yeah, you get scalable performance, add more MDSs and OSCs as needed. And we now have this in production for our general usage. But here's a couple of use cases. Um, the first one is called LHC at home. So this is like a, it's for people like you to go to LHC at home website and download a thing that's like a screensaver and then you can contribute CPU cycles to, to our science. Um, we have basically peaks of around the world, we have up to like 350,000 jobs running concurrently that are getting their input data and storing the outputs back to a CephFS um, and actually this plot on the right here shows when this particular service moved from one of these virtual NFS filers over to CephFS, they managed to like, the red, the red plot there is, is one of these applications that was like IO bound in the previous solution. And they moved from a peak of around 8,000 parallel jobs up to like 20,000. So more than doubling the, the throughput that they could get. Um, so yeah, please 
I encourage you to try that if you want to contribute to science. We're not using it for Bitcoin mining. <laughs> um, and the second one, well, this was what uh, actually Ricardo presented this morning. He gave a live demo of um, federated Kubernetes clouds doing physics analysis and generating s science results uh, through containers. Basically, each of, the, each of the steps, there's a lot of sub-processes. These are like complicated workflows processing the data and then sharing the data between. Each of the steps between those is sharing, is, is storing the result on a CephFS or in some cases a Rados gateway and then staging it out finally back to a, to a storage at the end. So there's some links there if you want to see um, more details about how that works. And, you know, it's always interesting to know like where are we going with this? Um, because you heard this morning in the keynote that we're doing already something like 60 to 70 petabytes per year. Um, but in the very near future, this will double or almost triple to close to like 150 petabytes per year. And then following this, we have it, the, the physicists are asking <laughs> that they want us to build a storage that can do like upwards of 600 petabytes per year, um, like around 2026, 2027. So this is why we do things like these big bang scale tests, okay? So we, we work together with the, the Ceph uh, developers to make sure that, to, to really test Ceph at scale. Um, the first one of these tests we did a couple of years ago back in Ceph Hammer release, and we tested a 7,200 OSD cluster that was 30 petabytes. And there were several limitations found in the way that Ceph communicates these so-called OSD maps. Um, we did a second similar size test with Ceph Joule, and in that case, we found the, that the communication between the OSDs and MONs was, um, was basically hammering the MON with too much uh, work, and it was having to store too much to its local level DB database, and it was all kind of like stuff that didn't need to be stored there. It was mainly just statistics about performance. Um, so this actually motivated, part, partly motivated the, the Ceph manager daemon, um, which is now in the Luminous release. And so we, we tested, just before Luminous was released, we managed to get 65 petabytes of disk, 10,800 OSDs put together um, to see if it worked, and actually it pretty much worked. There were a couple of problems here and there, but, but uh, yeah, seems, seems good now. So that's actually the end of my talk. I just want to say thanks both to my CERN colleagues, like, like Arna, et cetera, and uh, also like all the, like, this is like the community of, of contributors to, to the Ceph Luminous release because, you know, it's like a lot of, a lot of people contributing, um, also OpenStack, and it's like works really well. Yeah, that's it. Some questions? He's asking if there's any performance degradation, degradation after we went to hyperconverged. No, it's performing better. The performance improves, increases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you manage to um, separate the, so that the um, hyper uh, that the hypervisor, all, all the uh, KVM uh, uh, services will not kill the OSDs or vice versa? Vice versa. Vice versa. Um, this was, so this, we're doing hyperconverged cloud as well. This is hyperconverged uh, HPC that I presented. So, and, and yes, in, in rare cases, like I mentioned, uh, if the user jobs are, if the jobs are trying to use like 128 gigs of memory, then it can affect the, the OSTs. Yeah, it happens. So. The, the user jobs are contained with C groups. They have like a memory limit, but it seems somehow that that gets, it, they can go over the limit somehow. I don't know. This large scale test with uh, 10,000 OSDs was uh, made uh, based on uh, the Rados block device or uh, CephFS? Uh, so that w basically that was just a Rados test actually. 
we didn't put block devices or file system on top. Actually, well, we did put a, it's fun to put a startup one MDS and then just type DF. We did that just for fun, but we didn't test it that way. We tested it by, I mean, the biggest stress test that you can do to Ceph is, okay, you get Rados Bench going from several clients, and then there are a few crush parameters that you can just flip. You can flip a bit, and it reshuffles all of the data across the whole cluster. So this is what we were exercising, this back and forth flipping all of the data around. Uh, well, we did, so in, in, in a separate test, also separate from this, we tested a 1 billion file CFFS, and it seemed okay. I mean, we don't have long-term experience with a billion file CFFS. I, th yeah, I'm not, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember the number of files in our CFFS. It's hundreds of millions, something like this right now, yeah. We, we, use, we have three active MDSs at the moment on this cluster that I was mentioning here. So, yeah, so the, the applications communicate over InfiniBand and Ceph was using the, the 10 gig ethernet. That was just the easiest. But we, but we didn't have a separate client and cluster network. We use the same network for both, yeah. So this talk, so just to be clear, like this talk focused on the CFFS part. Yeah, yeah we use object storage natively in other places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if we were to, if we were to move to Ceph for all of our physics data, the 70 petabits per year, which we're, which we're not using Ceph for right now, this would be with Rados directly. Oh. Yeah. This is what we originally, this, we wrote this library called the Rados Striper. Um, this was for this use case. So this is a way like, because our objects are several gigabytes, and if you want to use Ceph, you don't store several gigabyte objects, you need to, you need to split them. So that's why we, we built this low level object store thing. Technically, I mean, you know, officially it's a scratch system um, because we don't have a good backup solution yet. That's why. But we haven't ever lost anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're, but the, the, they're, they're paying attention though. The, the, the physicists are paying attention because there was one case like uh, 18 months ago now where they let us know that once in one job they have in the log file proof that they wrote, a fi wrote something and then read back and they got all zeros in the, in the file. So there was definitely some cache problem. But haven't seen it. we saw it once and never again, who knows. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>